Hi, welcome to singletrackworld.com. I'm Hannah and I'm here with Chris Porter, who has been dropping off a new test bike for us today, a John Matron. Um, so we thought we'd grab the chance to, to speak to him a bit. You are uh, kind of well known for doing your own kind of mods on bits of suspension and things. So yeah. does that mean you don't think that the, there's anything in the market that quite does what you want it to? Or is that what you want it to, but the general public should stay well away of tweaking stuff? Well, I think that one of the issues with the bicycle industry is we've got real fast turnover of designs. Um, so you get a problem with the bicycle part and the person that solves it is the designer. So they just design a new one. Right. So you never actually get to the root cause of it. They just design their way out of the problem. But hang on a minute, somebody's just bought that. We've got to solve it for them now. Can't wait till next year. So my thoughts have always been, you know, if it needs hacking or changing, you find a solution with what you've got. And that's what we do, I guess, different to the rest of the industry, is that we try and fix what's already there, right. try and make a really good job out of what's already there, rather than um, just designing another thing. Right. Another thing that goes in landfill next year because it's not this year's thing. Or, you know, mm. it's like there's just so much new being made all the time and not necessarily any better. Right. Um, I don't, you know, just it's been made new just because it's new. Yeah. Um, rather than because it's an improvement. So what, I noticed you've got a different shock to what I've seen before on the bike that you've just dropped off. So what is good about that that's making you pick it to put it on your bikes? Um, the EXT, um, we're dealing with company called EXT now, they're Extreme Shocks, and we just love them. I think it's great. Um, if we think of the word cooperation and how close it is to the word corporation, but how different the meanings of those words are, that's the difference. Okay. You know? And the guys at EXT just act like a family. Um, they're great, you know, they're really good people to deal with. Um, and is their suspension any good though? Because, you know, oh, yeah, it can yeah, be I mean, lovely, yeah, but yeah. if your suspension's oh, no good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. He's, um, he's a crackpot, he's a great character, love Franco to bits, but he's gathered a set of really good individuals around him who work the suspension programmes for him. And they've made a really good bicycle shock absorber. In the bicycle world, um, there's a lot of feature selling. So if, some, if one suspension company makes a twin tube shock absorber, everyone else has got to make a twin tube shock absorber. If one suspension company does high speed and low speed compression and high speed and low speed rebound adjust, then everyone's got to do that. Um, you've got you're selling on features instead of selling on performance. And suspension on a bicycle must be progressive because there's no chassis weight at mm. all. Um, the sprung weight versus the unsprung weight, almost the same. So there's no real chassis weight. So the suspension must be progressive. So at the damping must be progressive. Um, and that's really difficult to do with the kind of valves that give you an adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, most of the adjustment valves that we've got in bicycling are preloaded sprung valves and they give you a real sort of poppy feeling. And then they try and sell you these as, as a design feature. They'll say, oh, it's digressive valving, man. It's what we want, digressive valving. And it's not what you want because we don't have a ton chassis to allow the wheel to pop like this and keep the chassis. We want it really progressive. We don't want it digressive, we want progressive. And the EXT shop puts a lot of oil through the shims. And shims are a demand valve. Old fashioned, analog. When they want more oil flow, they'll bend more. When, they, when you want less oil flow, they'll bend less. 
You don't need electronics or any fancy technology. That's what you need. You need to spend time riding the bike, playing with the shim stacks, trying things. And the other thing with the EXT is that they are real sticklers for um, quality control. So I've never seen as many dynos in a building in my no. life. They have tested dynos at every single bench. And they have portable dynos. They've got like seven or eight shock dynos that are just lying around in the front of the building that might go in a van to do a bit of testing with someone. And um, every single shock they do gets dynoed to make sure that it reaches the damping levels at two different speeds. Mm -hmm. So it does, they do it slow, they do it fast, and they make sure that it reaches the damping force that it should in two different clicker settings as well. Right. So if it doesn't, it comes apart until they find out why it didn't. You know, maybe a, a shim was bent or... Yeah. It'd be hard to do that because they check every single shim, you know. Right. They're quite careful. And that's really nice because that's what I used to do for my shocks. Right. And I'm seeing someone being as careful as I was. So it gives you a degree shock. of confidence in it then, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So if that's what you're looking for in the, in the shock at the rear, what are you looking for? In a fork uh, and who's delivering it or who looks like they might deliver it in what's coming oh, god. do you have an opinion on that oh god the bicycle fork is so close to its design limit it's amazing that more of them don't just fail they're horrible um we we've, we've got fixed bushing systems which create a huge amount of leverage on on that lower bushing, so it creates a lot of sight, a lot of shear force on the bushing, so you get a lot of bushing binding. And as the fork goes through its travel, that doesn't change. In most in most uh, telescopic fork um, applications, well, all others, you'll have a fixed bushing under the seal, and then you'll have a sliding bushing at the other end. Mm -hmm. So. As the fork goes into its travel, the leverage on that lower bushing lessens. The fixed bushings create that binding problem straight off. Then you put a spring on one side and a damper on the other. Um, and then you, you're binding the fork by literally bending the chassis like mm -hmm. this now. Because we're, we're holding the body weight up here, but it's supported on the center line of the wheel. So it's now binding like this. And then you hit it fast, hit a bump, and we're resisting on the damper, so it does that. So now we've got the, the fork chassis doing this. And you can literally see it and feel it. You watch it in slow-mo, and you can see it. You can literally see it happening. So to improve this, considering this was what was happening when we had a 20 mil axle at 110 mil wide, how are we going to improve that? I'll tell you what, let's go wider, let's go boost. Let's reduce the axle size and let's use a QR mm -hmm. with no pinch bolts. So they're getting worse and worse. Literally, the forks are, the forks are at the design limit. They, something needs to change. Um, okay. And there's a lot of, obviously people have noticed this because we've got things like the motion, we've got things like the, um, that Dave Weagle thing. Trust performance. Yeah, we got, you know, things are happening. People are looking for other ways of solving the problem. But because the bicycle fork industry is Taiwan based, no one else can cast magnesium lowers. We need to come away from that whole cast magnesium lower thing full stop. Right. Because we need to, we need to get some decent sliding bushings in there. So and is that our future then? Oh. In the UK, this is, this is where we can make a difference. <laughs> well, I mean, what we're doing at the moment is we're going to try and do, well, we'll try and do, we're deep into doing a dual crown kit for the 36 fork. It's been working really well. By holding the fork legs 
more rigidly parallel, the fork works better anyway. Right. It doesn't solve the bushing issue, it masks some of the problem of the bushing issue, so it works better. When you look at a single crown fork, again, you know, slow-mo that, watch someone riding through some braking bumps. Someone riding through braking bumps without actually touching the brakes, and you'll see that the forks are flexing three, four, maybe even five degrees. Right. And if they're flexing backwards and forwards three or four or five degrees, then they're also doing that in a turn. So they're doing this, they're moving all over the place. It's a, it's a wonder more of them don't creak, mm. not that they do creak. It's a wonder it's more It's quite don't. scary when you do get a, a fork like that, mm. out, out of like a, a lower end fork, mm. out of its depth, and you, and you really experience that. That's, yeah. that's quite... <laughs> yeah, and if, you, and if you can feel that and you weigh a hell of a lot less than me, but That's I'm very kind of you to say. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't dare guess. <laughs> That's probably a state secret. But um, the average mountain biker looks more like me. You know, it's quite a lump. Um, we're all getting older. Um, and we're riding longer travel forks that are getting lighter and lighter and lighter. There's just not enough material. I mean, literally, if you take a fork apart, get hold of the crane steerer unit, you can literally push it in and out right. and measure that. You can measure that. Push it in, measure it, pull it out, measure it, it's moved. So if it's moving by hand, it's, it's not, mm, okay. not good enough. I, d I don't know, I mean, the, I don't know where the future lies, but I know that we need to be looking at different solutions for sure. Cool. I can't afford to fix it, um, if I could. I would definitely be doing a fork, but... Uh, right. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. So, so, if there's an investor out there that wants to see a much better fork, then you're the man to come to with uh, oh, opinions good, and ideas. Oh, good God, no. An invest <laughs> investor would not like me. No, no, no. No, an investor would not like me. <laughs> um, okay, a uh, final question then, because I do have to rush off, unfortunately. That's right. Um, and, and we it's got cold. Back to politics, yeah. Well, we? I, no, uh, yeah. Okay, so it could be politics. Let's do the environment. You said about um, things not being particularly strong yeah. and invention for the sake of new things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. What does the bicycle industry need to do on this sort of environmental well, front? Well, I mean, on a you know on on a scale of the big questions, the bicycle industry is just fluff, isn't it? We are what we are doing is fluff. We're not doing anything useful for the world, for the, at all. You know, we're. But we're, we should be. Bicycles could change the world. Bicycles could change the world, but mountain bikes are not the same as bicycles. No, they're not. We go and ride our mountain bikes for fun. We don't use them as transport. In Britain, our our system has been organised to create car travel for years. You know, we you won't get planning permission to build a business in the same place you'll get planning permission to put houses. The things have been separated to make us drive our cars and the system has been skewed to the private car to the point where most of the bicycle usage is on old railway tracks. Well, they were quite useful, weren't they, railways? As railways, yeah. Yeah, as railways or canal paths, which could still be quite useful for moving heavy slow be very you know, slow, slow turn, here. <laughs> but slow turn over goods you don't need to be moving sand quickly um but you see sand lorries driving you know lorries driving the stuff around at 60 miles an hour. we don't need to move sand quickly that's there's a lot of it around but that's our system you know that's how it's been done so you know in, t in terms of environmental we can't defend ourselves just because we're bicycles what we're doing is fluff the best thing we can do is to carry on using the stuff that we are using for as long as possible. And that's, you know, that's something we should be building bicycles that last. So maybe we don't need any suspension at all. We just need all rigid bikes well, and, you know, take them to the shops as well. That if, that, if that's, you know, if that's what you're enjoying riding, that's absolutely what you should have. Um, I actually quite enjoy riding off-road and... As we built the bikes more and more capable, we've ended up riding even more challenging off-road trails. So 
I certainly won't be looking to build a hardtail anytime soon. My weekly shop, it, we're not getting pannier mates on the geometro anytime <laughs> soon. So, you know. Wouldn't be very good for taking eggs home, would it? <laughs> um, Down the trail. <laughs> no, probably not. But yeah, no, we, we should just make the stuff last longer and make it better. Just make it so that you can fix it. That was one of the things that, you know, I was proud of at Mojo. All the Fox stuff that we fixed that didn't end up worth nothing, being resented, propping a garage door open because it no longer worked. We fixed that stuff. You know, obviously some stuff you can and, mm. you know, some things are going to be just bent beyond recognition, but rather than replacing assemblies, you know, taking a cartridge, throwing it out and putting a new one in, we were fixing it, using our skills to fix stuff. And that's, you know, that that's changed a lot in mountain biking now. You get a warranty problem with a mountain bike product now and you get a new one. And for the first couple of times you think, yeah, I got a new this, that, or the other, I got a new, completely new product. I feel really good about that. And after the fourth or fifth time, you start to think, was that really worth what I paid for it? Why didn't they do some testing before they let it out to the public? Um, and why didn't they have a system to look after it? Mm. You know, and that's, there's not, there's not that sort of attitude in the mountain bike industry at the moment. It's all being driven. Well, no, that's, that's, that's wrong to say that. There is that attitude. It's all in small places. The big corporates are not doing that, but there are a lot of good people doing good work in mountain biking and keeping things going. That's what we should encourage. So support your small local bike shop, uh, your, your uh, local innovator, and maybe your local magazine as well. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think not, yeah, support your local everyone, but if they're not worth supporting, you know, don't, don't struggle with it. Find the guy that is worth supporting and that, that person will come along. Um, and there's a lot of good people out there. Yeah, so yeah, support your magazines for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, find, find the good people in life and, and support your local magazines. I yes. think we'll, we'll, we'll uh, that sounds like a good life message and yeah. we'll oh. leave it there. And we didn't get on to Trump or Brexit. <laughs> Trump or Brexit, Next we can time. definitely do again. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. When we've not? got longer, yeah. a lot longer. <laughs> yeah. And when it's a bit warmer, I'm literally you. shivering. Yeah, <laughs> I'll book you a bed and breakfast next time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers, Hannah. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Bob.